If you have your Bibles or Testaments with you, we're turning to Luke's Gospel and chapter 23, the 23rd chapter of Luke, and reading from the verse 33, these familiar verses, yes, yet solemn and powerful as they are. Luke 23, verse 33 and we're at the cross. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. The malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly? For we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. We'll end the reading there. And God has promised to bless his word. Let us bow in a moment's prayer, please. Our Father, we give you thanks tonight again for extending the day of grace. We give you thanks tonight, our Father, for the messages and song that we have listened to and the choruses that we have been singing and the word of God that has been read. And our Father, we pray now that thou wilt come and countenance thyself amongst us and that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would be upon us. We pray that thy word, Lord, will dig deep and, and go forth, Lord, with demonstration and power. And we pray, our Father, for those who know thee not as Saviour, those who have got themselves into a cold, backslidden state, may return to the Lord, and may great things be accomplished. Lord, we need thee. Great is our need of thee tonight, for without thee we are hopeless and useless and worthless. Bless thy precious word for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. When Karl Marx was dying on the 4th of March, 1883, his housekeeper came into the death chamber and she said to him, I want to record your last words. In a faint but in a very angry voice, he said to her, get out. Last words are only for fools. Well, if you know anything about Karl Marx, no man died a bigger fool than he did or said as many foolish things as he did. 
or indeed died such a hopeless and Christless death as any man ever died. Karl Marx, the founder of Marxism. Thomas Hobbes, who corrupted some of England's greatest young men, when he was dying, said the atheist, he said, if I had the whole world, I'd give it to live one day. I'm looking for a hole to crawl into. I'm about to take a leap into the dark. The French agnostic Mirabeau said when he was dying, give me more morphine that I might not think of eternity. Another renowned atheist said, the one thing that spoils everything for me is that the Bible might be true. And if the Bible is true, I'm damned. More recent and closer than that, in 1988, in a mission in Armagh, an elderly man left on the closing night, and he went home to die. I sat with him before he died, and here was his words, I'm a damned soul. Now, if you want a contrast to those deathbeds, here are some. John Wesley, when he was dying, his face shining like an angel, said, best of all, God is with us. D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, said, I see him. Earth is receding, heaven is opening, and God is calling. A 17-year-old girl dying with an incurable disease, whose father was an infidel and atheist, who wrote a blasphemous book on the divinity of Christ, I had, a, had a wife and this girl's mother, who was a godly, born-again woman. A father, a renowned atheist, and a mother, a godly child, and born again by the Spirit of God. Both of them witnessed to her for their 17 years of life, and on her deathbed, when the both of them were round the bed, she said, Father and Mother, which of you do I believe? Who do I believe? I'm going out into death. And the father broke down at the bedside and began to cry and said, Believe your mother, your mother, and I'll follow you someday. Death's not buffoonery. Death is not for foolery. Death is real. Death is solemn. And death needs to be prepared for. Whenever the Lord Jesus Christ was dying, he uttered seven dying statements that we call the seven sayings of our Savior on the cross. I want to call your attention tonight to the first one of those. Because before and during the time he was hoisted up between the thieves on that hill lone and grey at Golgotha, as the soldiers blasphemed him, as they mocked him, as the spread eagle him on that old rugged cross that we were reading about there tonight at Calvary, as they smashed him and began to drive the nails into his hand and his feet, his first and mighty cry was, as the blood was beginning to flow, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was the first of the seven last words of our Savior on the cross at Calvary. Now, I understand that the original Greek means that he kept on repeating it and crying it. And as the socket, as the, as the cross went down into, the, into its socket, every bone in his body went out of joint. And as they were kneeling him, and as they were hoisting him, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, and the Creator of all things, continually, continually cried out, Father, 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 forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
Now, my friends, why did he cry this cry? What was the reason and the purpose for these words? Indeed, what was the reason and the purpose for such a death as this, for such a man as this? Do you ever consider, do you ever survey, Isaac Watts says, when I survey the wondrous cross, do you ever stop to survey it? Do you ever stop to think of it? Why God's only beloved son, harmless and sinless, was hanging there naked on that cross, battered and bludgeoned by wicked and filthy hands of men. Do you ever consider, my friend, why he hung and died there? These words, why were they uttered? Well, I'm going to make an attempt tonight as we close this meeting to give you what I believe in my heart to be some of the reasons why he cried this cry, this first cry, Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. First of all, it was to stay the wrath of God from falling on sinners. It was to stay the wrath of God from falling on sinners. Now, don't get it into your head that it was only the Roman soldiers and those around the cross doing this barbaric act that he was praying for. He was praying for forgiveness for the whole world, for the whole world of sinners lost. He was praying for the Herods and the Caesars and the Pilots and the Thieves and the Hitlers and the Mussolinis and the Karl Marx and the Bertie Johnsons, and he was praying for you. He was interceding to the Father for you and me tonight. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, we're all children of wrath. Christ died for the ungodly. He loved me and gave himself for me and for you tonight. He cried to stay the wrath of God from you and me. We all need forgiveness. You know, I often stood at that old home on Bishop Street where that's him of Francis Alexander penned. There is a green hill looking out over the bog side from the city wall. There is a green hill far away without a city wall where our dear Lord was crucified who died to save us all. He died that we might be forgiven. Forgiven. You need your sins forgiven. We're born in sin and shape and in iniquity and your sins can never be forgiven other than through the blood of Jesus Christ and through the work of Calvary. We all need forgiveness. Paul the Apostle says in Acts 13, Be it known unto you, therefore, brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And that's what we are trying to do these nights. We're trying to preach the Word of God, preaching on to men and women, not only in this tent, but further afield, as they listen to these messages, preaching on to you that through this man, and this man alone, not a priest, not a pope, not a minister, my dear friend, not a church, through this man, Jesus Christ, is found the forgiveness of sin. We have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. And the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, what? To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The man dying with the palsy came to the Lord Jesus and here's what he said to him. Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Now because of that cry from the cross, the wrath of God was turned from sinful men and wicked men and all men and all sinners, for there was no other way. If ever there was a prayer answered, and we're praying away these nights for souls, and thank God for the praying people, but if ever there was a prayer answered, it was this one. Within an hour, the thief was forgiven. The Roman centurion, before he left the cross, was forgiven. He could say, surely this is a righteous man. 
At Pentecost, Peter preached, 3,000 souls were saved. Then another 2,000 souls were saved. Paul was saved. Lydia was saved. He, right on through the Acts of the Apostles, the jailer and Enoch, and right through, right through, hour after hour, day after day, year after year, century after century, down to this very moment, he's still saving sinners. Hallelujah. And he's able to save to the uttermost them that come to him through the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. He prayed it to stay the wrath of God for sinners. Secondly, he prayed it in order that he would obey the word of God. You know, the Lord Jesus always obeyed the word of his Father. It was his delight to do the Father's will. Not like some of God's people, they do not obey his word. And if you're in this meeting tonight and you're saved or supposed to be saved and you're living in rebellion and not obeying the word of God, remember this. Remember there's a day of accountability coming for you. You need to obey his word. And those of you who are not here, here tonight and who are not saved, you need to obey his word. As he calls you night after night and says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You need to come to him when he speaks to you. Jesus Christ obeyed the word of the Father as he hung there naked, as the vultures flew out over his head. I tell you this, he was obeying God's word. You know why? And we haven't time to go into it tonight, but away back 760 years before that, 760 years and more before that, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53 wrote these words. Now, my friend, this is a mighty book. This is a prophetical book as well as a historical book, as well as an evangelical book, and we could go on. This is the word of the living God. 760 years, the prophet Isaiah penned these words. And here's what he said. And he, speaking about our Lord Jesus, was numbered with the transgressors. That's the thieves that's hanging one on every side of them. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for sinners, they pierced his hands and his feet, and all his bones went out of joint. And different Psalms and different places in the Old Testament, Psalm 69, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, many other scriptures speak about Christ on the cross at Calvary. And one of the other cries of the cross of the seven was, I thirst. I thirst, and the tongue claved to the roof of his mouth. Why did he say, I thirst? Well, it tells us, so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. As he hung here on the cross, my friend, every word was being fulfilled. Every jot and tittle belonging to Christ was being fulfilled because he could say again, I delight to do the will of God. He could have called 12 legions of the angels. If ever there was a time when he could have got his eyes of the word and got his eyes of the goal, it was now. If ever there was a time when he couldn't pray and when he wouldn't obey, he had thought it was now when he was hanging languishing there. Let me say a wee word to the believers tonight. Some of you in this meeting, maybe you're going through the storms. Maybe you're going through trials. Maybe there's fierce affliction visiting you. I don't know what's going on in your life or your home or in your family, but I'm sure there's something going on for the, the devil's always at something. And listen, let me say to you tonight, hold on. Hold on. The Lord Jesus held on. He endured the cross. He despised the shame. He didn't give up. He didn't turn back. He completed everything. He finished. One of the other cries was, just finished. Hold on, my friend. You see, he couldn't do anything now. His feet were not walking the dusty roads of Palestine. His hands were not catching the children and caressing them. His eyes were not on the sparrow as they were when he was there. But let me tell you this. He's hanging on the cross, and he's, 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 
He's suffering awful pain, pain that we'll never know anything about, that he had excruciating pain as he hung on the nails. But listen, there was one thing he could do. He could pray. What is your prayer life like, believer? Well, there's some of us not too. Some of you is not so bright for having seen many as in the prayer meeting. Come on now. Come on, what's your prayer life like? Hmm? Do you ever consider what he has done for you? He intercedes for you, he saved you, and then you're going to lose, so oh, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, and that's all about it. No, no, it's not. Oh, I say to you, listen, you can pray. You mightn't be able to do much. You mightn't be able to preach, and they're to a penny anyway. You mightn't be able to sing. But listen, listen, you can pray. You can pray. Pray for these young men as they preach. Pray for these meetings. Pray. We're going into the, uh, nearly coming to the end of the first week. I trust you're praying. We're having a prayer meeting tomorrow night at a quarter past seven. We have a prayer meeting last night. We're praying. We're seeking God. Pray like you never prayed before. The Lord Jesus prayed. Oh, it was dark. Very dark. And whatever your trial that you're in tonight, my friend, it's not as dark. It's not as painful. It's not as humiliating as my Savior suffered there on the cross. It's not the job of our Lord Jesus Christ now to pray for sinners. He ever liveth in the glory for he rose again and he lives in the power of an endless life. He ever lives to make intercession for us, the people of God. No, no, that, that, that duty of prayer is handed down to us, the born-again believers. And we need to pray, and we need to keep praying, and keep praying, and keep asking God to forgive sinners. He ever liveth to pray for the saints. Lastly, not staying the wrath of God, obeying the word of God. And this is profound tonight. And probably the greatest of them all. He cried, forgive them, as he cried, forgive them. He was declaring the love of God. Don't ever, don't ever chastise us or a preacher of the gospel who preaches the cross for not preaching on the love of God. My dear friend, you can get no greater declaration of the love of God than Jesus Christ, the Son, hanging on that cross at Calvary. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son and as he hung there surveying tonight and picture him tonight, for this is what this mission is all about, and this is what we are all about. It's not about us. We are here to declare a man. We are here to declare the only man that ever walked without sin on this broad acres of earth. We are here to declare the creator of all things, who made the heavens and the earth, and who condescended to men of low estate and became, uh, became a, a servant, a slave. A bond slave, he that the heavens of heavens couldn't contain, he, 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 he came to the matrix of the virgin's womb. He, God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly came man in, in the womb of Mary. Can you understand it? Can you comprehend it? You never will and you never can. And with the, that, that sinless child of God, as he grew up to be a man, and as the blood was shed at Calvary's cross, it was all love, love, love. It's all to do with love. God loves you tonight. He loves you. What manner of love is this? What manner of man is this that would pray in this manner for these men as they were crucifying him and nailing him to the cross? Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. He's laying them down, laying it down for his enemies. For his enemies. 
You see, these Romans that were mocking and scourging and spitting upon my Savior, they worshipped a number of gods. Do you know what one of their gods was? It was the God of revenge. Love and forgiveness wasn't even in their vocabulary or in their thinking. They were hard. They were callous. Well, I think people think it's awful now that the, these Isa boys are beheading boys in the Middle East. I tell you this, these boys would have beheaded you and they did behead many. Love wasn't in their being. Love wasn't in their theology. They worship the God of revenge. Forgiveness wasn't, they weren't even thinking about it. They could have knocked blue, uh, split your head off, my friend, and they wouldn't have cost them a thought that they laugh and they jeered as they're doing round the cross with an innocent man, with a holy man, a man who never done any harm on them, never done any wrong, a man who never said a word wrong, who never did a thing wrong, and they're nailing them here between thieves, and they're mocking, and they're laughing, and they're jeering, and they're spitting, and they're blaspheming, and they're as hard as that. Some of you tonight may be in this meeting, and you're hard. You're hard, sir. I tell you, we're hard as a cross, of the cross of Christ doesn't break us and smash us. We're hard if we can come to Calvary and sing hymns like we're singing them and not know what it really means when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Do you know that the Prince of Glory died there? Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? Does it concern you tonight? Does it, listen, I'm talking to you believers tonight. Does it melt your heart to think that he done it all for you? And for me, who blasphemed his preachers, who blasphemed his name, who hated the things of God. He did it for me. And all the time it was, he, he, he wanted to save me. He stayed the wrath of God from me. There was nothing else could stay the wrath of God from a sinful world. And let me tell you, there's nothing else can stay it tonight. And the wrath of God is upon the nation. She's about to be divided. The wrath of God is upon our nation. It's the only thing that will stay, the wrath of God. Is the blood of Christ. That's all. Nothing else. And we try it yourself. And not do. Communion or confirmation or church going will never take away your sin. Or if that was the case, then this whole thing is a sham. It's all in vain. There was no need for it. Not a bit need for it. If the Sermon on the Mount could save you. We're not here talking about the Sermon on the Mount. God forbid, Paul says, that I glory save in the cross, not the Sermon on the Mount, not in the parables, not in his good life and his good works, and thank God for every one of them, but save in the cross, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it, my friend. Let it get, let it get a grip of us tonight. Let us read, let us survey it tonight. Let us get it deep into our thinking tonight. Let us understand it tonight. Let us begin to, 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 to once more consider, consider him and what he has done for us there. These hard, callous men, they, 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 they blasphemed him. But he didn't. he didn't. He didn't remonstrate with them. He didn't blaspheme them. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. Like a sheep before his ears is dumb, he opened not his mouth. Do you know, my friend, that one thing that distinguishes the Christian or should from all other philosophies is, is forgiveness. Forgiveness. And I trust as a believer tonight that you're not harboring some unforgiven sin or something about a man or woman or a believer another believer in your heart and in your life. I trust that you're not harboring some old bitter spirit. 
God help us in the light of Calvary. We cannot and we must not and we should not and we should never want to. May God pour a spirit of forgiveness into his church and into his people. May God help us to flee back to the foot of the cross and get a new desire for him, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Listen, sinner, he wants to forgive your whole sins tonight. And, and, and if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just. And I, I was said that in the meeting one night, and a wee woman come to me afterwards and just said, Mr. John, I couldn't begin to confess all my sins. I wouldn't know them all. I says, I didn't mean that, and God doesn't mean that. But what he does mean is this, if you confess that you're a sinner and you say, Lord, I'm a sinner, what would happen if you'd have missed one? <laughs> no, no, what it means is this, if we confess our sins, if we acknowledge and bow our head and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I've never seen it to tonight what you suffered on the cross and it was for me. It wasn't just for these men, it was for me. And for years I've gone on without you, and for years I, I, I wanted nothing to do with you, but Lord, you died for me. And I'm asking you now, would you forgive my sins? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the verse I was saved from, the verse in John. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. And I came at a quarter past eleven one Monday morning out in the farmyard, the other side of Hannah's Skillen. Some of my own people are sick listening to this, but they will be sick listening to it, for I've nothing else to talk about. And there at a quarter past eleven that Monday morning, I cried and I said, Lord, do something with this life. Do something with this life. I'm sick of it, I'm tired of it, I'm weary of it. If there's something better in life than this and I want it, I didn't know to say saved hardly, I didn't know any Bible. But I knew nobody had to tell me there was something not right. I don't need anybody to tell me that something was not right. And you don't need anybody to tell you tonight that things are not right in your life. Very well you know it. Very well you know it. You've been considering this whole gospel thing. You've been considering death. You've been considering heaven. You've been considering hell. And you will be before these meetings are over, for that's what we'll be preaching on. But that's all the message that we have, that God loved you. Christ died for you to keep you out of he hell and to take you into heaven. Oh, I tell you, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us our sins. And I testify to that after 44 years, that I never met a more faithful man than Christ. Oh, I tell you, and he gets sweeter as the days go by, and I love him with all my heart and with all my soul. And if you get to heaven before me, just tell him, says you, Johnson says he loves you. God loves you. Christ died for you. And he lives in the power of an endless life, and he's a place prepared for you if you'll come. But repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Twenty-five years ago, my wife and two girls and another girl went to Bournemouth for summer holidays. We drove down through Ireland and crossed over to Fishguard in Wales on the night boat. Half one or two o'clock in the morning headed down through Wales, down through England, about four o'clock as the dawn was breaking, we pulled into the city of Bath. Car park was locked and I went down, drove round and went into a side street. The girls and Pat were dozing and sleeping. 
And I got out of the car, took the keys with me, and said I was going for a walk. And I went for a walk, and when I started to walk, I thought about the Roman baths, so the far away from here, and I discovered that they were not too far away. And I walked to the old Roman baths, and they were closed up, but I looked in through the window in that ancient city. And I walked round at a time or two, and the dawn was beginning to break more. And I headed back to the car, but I couldn't find the car. And I had the keys, and I thought, they'll think there's something wrong with me. And I walked up one street and down another street, and I began to panic a bit, and I was walking up, up a street and looking around me. And this fella sweeping the streets came driving down in a left-hand drive vehicle. And he reached over, he was coming towards me as I was going up, and he reached over and he opened the door. He says, you're like a man was lost. And I said, I am, I, I can't find my car. And I hadn't that out of me till he tried to pull the door out of my hand. But I held on to it. He says, you're from Northern Ireland. I says, I am. He says, I had one son one son, and I lost him in Northern Ireland. And I said, I didn't kill him. And he told me where it was. It's not that far from here. And I said, my wife and children's in the car, and I don't know where it is. He says, get in, I'll take you. I know where your car is. I got up into this big road sweeping lorry at five o'clock in the morning, sitting beside this man, the tears flowing down his face, with a photograph of his boy up at the front. He says, that's him. He says, I saw the Northern Irish number plates. I know where your car is. And as he drove me towards the car, all he said was, that's him. That's him. That's him tonight. With a greater love than that father had for his son. He has a love for you. But you've got to come. Will you come tonight? There's a little porter cabin. We have booklets. Here's he knocking, let him in. You're going to let him in tonight. Don't spurn his love. Don't make little of Calvary. Don't say it wasn't for me.